This panel uh, is called The Unlikely Entrepreneurs, which irritated at least one of the entrepreneurs on the panel when, when he saw the name. Uh, when, when we started choreographing this whole thing and thinking of a sequence of um, talks and speakers and stuff, my original instinct was to go down the street in Silicon Valley and, and bring a couple of sort of stereotypical success story entrepreneurs, and I realized those guys are generally full of crap. Um, they're going to get up here and lecture everybody about how great Silicon Valley is and how smart they are and how stupid everybody else on the planet is. And, and that, it's patently false, but it's also not what people want to hear. So I was thinking, well, this conference is about transformation. This conference is about evolution. And in my experience, the greatest innovators come from the most unexpected places. That's why I named the panel The Unlikely Entrepreneurs. So I invited some friends. Um, Tak um, is the co-founder of a company called Soracom uh, in Japan. He'll tell you a bit about what they do. Japan um, is one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world. Uh, it, the stereotype in the West about Japan for the last 20, 30 years is it's you know, driven by large industrial corporations, a lot of formality, a lot of sort of color within the lines, don't stick up. I, I, I'm very privileged to have spent most of my career in Japan dealing with Japanese companies. I, sometimes I, I think I'm reincarnated from a Japanese person, but I've studied Japanese history a lot. And if you study Japanese history, you find Japan to be one of the most entrepreneurial nations in history. And what we're seeing in Japan is a real awakening of the Japanese entrepreneurial spirit. And Takana's brother founded a company a few years ago called Sarakon that was recently acquired by KDDI, and their story is amazing. Amit is the founder and the CEO of a company called Autogrid that's creating very strategic uh, infrastructure for um, energy companies. Peter, uh, who's, who's wearing an advertisement on his shirt, thank you. Uh, Peter is, is one of the greatest intrapreneurs I've ever met. Uh, Long-term uh, grid guy at Westnet, uh, really looked around and, and had this brilliant idea of, of how to disrupt the industry from the inside, has created a company called Digiku, which he'll tell you about shortly. Um, this is, again, if you study entrepreneurship, this, this is an archetype. Uh, Michael Bloomberg uh, used to work at Solomon Brothers, and, and that was, you know, he went to his boss and he said, I've got this great idea to build a workstation that can help Wall Street traders trade much more efficiently. So his boss fired him, and uh, he went off and, and created a company called Bloomberg that is far bigger than, well, Solomon Brothers doesn't exist anymore, so there you go. And finally, Thomas Laurent. Um, has founded a company called um, Axelos. I, I have to look because I keep saying Askelos, but um, it uh, came out of MIT and, and EPFL in, in uh, Lausanne. Um, they're uh, providing blockchain technologies for renewable energy, and they'll talk some more about it. But again, uh, we don't think of uh, academics as being great innovators. Academics are probably the ultimate innovators because they live right at the edge of knowledge. They're creating uh, something from nothing. They're looking out into the unknown. And some of the greatest companies in the world have come, come from, from universities. You know, Qualcomm, for example, and, and, and the company that preceded Qualcomm. But anyway, I'll stop talking and I'll ask each of these guys, we can start with talk maybe, just to say a little bit about their companies. Um, by the way, I, I, if anyone has questions in real time during the panel, just Raise your hand up, I'll throw this thing at you and you can ask a question, uh, or we can wait till the end. But I would like to make you guys work for, the, for lunch and, and get the audience involved a little more than previous panels. So, dozo. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much. The so Japanese I... are also the most <laughs> polite people in the world. <laughs> so, I'm Taku Tamagawa. Um, so I'm responsible for uh, operations for Americas for my company. And also, nowadays, I'm looking into a, uh, EU expansion as well. And uh, I do actually have a, a, a little video to show you. Uh, maybe it's going to be refreshing to show you a video. I don't know if we have an audio, too. So this was created by Japanese government. This is my brother. When companies have tried to utilize IoT in products and business, the huge initial investment has been a barrier for them. 
A Japanese venture that has overturned that orthodoxy is now attracting considerable attention. We developed an IoT system that is affordable even for small teams or startups with limited financial power. That's why we redesigned mobile data communication technology for IoT. The main driver behind the high cost was the need to create a dedicated core system from scratch. This venture replaces the physical telecom core with cloud-based software, so data can travel from SIMS to the cloud where it is managed and controlled. This makes it possible to manage data flow in the cloud. Even when data is sent from a large number of devices, it is sent simultaneously. This system drastically reduced connection costs. I call it the democratization of IoT. In Japan, a wide range of startups and companies are beginning to use IoT to revolutionize society. Even elevators that were not on the network can be connected using this new IoT technology. Operations have become much more efficient. Relying on IoT where we needed it gave us more time to tend to the pigs our work became much more efficient. Through this, I want to improve the image of the livestock industry. We were able to use the smallest amount of data necessary, which reduced power consumption to one-tenth of what it was. We hope our products can serve not only for personal use, but also as a part of urban infrastructure. Before, only big companies had the resources to spur innovation. But we want people who want to change the future with passion. Individuals, startups, and ventures to innovate too. Thank you. I think Amit's going to do this in analog. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't have the multimedia presentation, and uh, I'm your prototypical Silicon Valley entrepreneur, uh, unfortunately. So uh, 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 my company, AutoGrid, is based in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, we do operate in uh, 12 countries now with customers, uh, about 100 people. Uh, and we started the company with a very simple observation that uh, Throughout history, we have really equated energy with the consumption of natural resources. And now we have access to a new type of resource, which, we, which is data, which is not only clean and cheap, it's actually the only resource in the world, if you think about it, which is growing. So how can we use this data as a new source of power? And we started looking at a lot of different use cases early on. Uh, uh, and we figured out that in this world, uh, as we are transitioning to, uh, towards a carbon-free uh, future, the central problem is really how to deal with the intermittency of renewables. And uh, we have to change the paradigm uh, if we have to keep the system uh, cheap, reliable, uh, and, and, and efficient if, if uh, we uh, want to make, uh, if, we, uh, uh, if we want to manage a very large penetration of renewables. And so uh, we settled on an application. Uh, we call it AI-driven real-time control application for optimizing a very large number of distributed uh, energy resources which are connected uh, to the grid. And uh, we call it AutoGrid Flex, uh, which allows us to uh, uh, take data from uh, tens of thousands of uh, assets, uh, see what's happening across the entire network, 
and then uh, predict what might happen in the future and use all this information to make micro adjustments on both demand and supply side of the network to see how we can keep it balanced. Uh, today we have about uh, 5,000 megawatts of what we call flexible energy assets on our system. Uh, we are operating in three continents, about 12, uh, 12 countries. Uh, we have grown the megawatts under management by over 10x in the last uh, three years. Uh, we see that, uh, that this is really uh, something that both regulated and deregulated energy companies uh, are looking for on the deregulated side, we heard from uh, our friends at Origin, uh, the market is very competitive, they want to differentiate, they want to acquire new customers, they want to retain customers, they want to have a, a new value proposition which is differentiated not just based on commodity electrons, but also how they can become a full energy service provider. So we see a lot of adoption of DERs around uh, customer acquisition and customer satisfaction. At the same time, we see that a lot of optimization uh, uh, is necessary to extract more IRR from these resources. In Europe here, we see a lot of uh, wind farms which are coming off of feed-in tariffs, uh, so they're now exposed to merchant risk. A lot of storage uh, systems are also exposed to merchant risk, and, uh, and, and uh, the, the game is now shifting a lot towards not just deploying capital at the lowest possible uh, cost, but trying to see how to maximize the value. So one of the asset categories that we are very... Uh, 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 very focused on is one of the fastest growing categories is battery storage in all its forms. So we cover uh, all different applications of battery storage in Japan and in Australia and in California as well. We are working with residential batteries uh, where uh, there is now an increasing use case around self-consumption of solar and uh, managing uh, people trying to get more resiliency and backup uh, while uh, they are optimizing their energy costs. We are also looking at commercial and industrial storage, uh, where depending on the rates that customers are exposed to, uh, the IRR can be really fantastic. In California, we see routinely uh, IRRs of 30% plus for deploying storage when you take into account all the different incentives. Uh, in Asia Pac, we see a lot of uh, opportunities around deploying storage in uh, microgrid uh, context, where uh, you have large industrial parks or campuses, uh, which are relying on diesel, and now the cost of solar and storage for diesel replacement is actually lower than just the OPEX of, uh, of, of run, running these generators. And then finally, you have utility scale storage, where uh, the intermittency of renewables and the cost associated with it in the imbalanced markets can be uh, hedged and uh, reduced by, by storage. So we like to think that, uh, that uh, there is a 10 trillion plus uh, new energy gold rush that is happening uh, right now. And, and we are providing the picks and shovel. We like to think these are the smartest picks and shovels out there, uh, which the miners uh, who are trying to go for this gold uh, will use to, to strike it rich. Yeah, hello together, I'm Peter. Um, I'm the managing director of, of Digico, and we founded that company um, two years ago. And we are 100% a subsidiary of, of Energy. And um, the reason why we did that was uh, I had some, some special impressions about the internal situation in the DSO, about data and the question we always discussed about uh, systems like SAP or GIS, and we never discussed data. And um, I was responsible one time on the other side of the Rhine here in Neuss for that grid operation and um, all things around uh, managing the grid. And we lost many concessions here in that area, so we have to share data. And if you try to share data with other parties, they, they like to have one data set and you have to deliver every quarter. And this is something which has not happened today or can't happen today because uh, every DSO, every utility, every retail part got his data in many several data silos. And we said, hey, let's grab out all these data together in one platform and try to figure out what we can do in the future. So we are really coming from the DSO side, from the grid side, and um, most people talking about the retail customer. I want to talk about our internal customer, our employees, and they have to handle the future. Everything is, uh, will come up with, with EV uh, charging at home or in public areas or business areas or solar plants, etc. So everything what we discuss in the future around energy is related to the grid. And this is the most important uh, infrastructure we have 
uh, worldwide because every day we are more related to electricity. And um, so we said, okay, let's take a look at the data. And most thing, or mostly, uh, if you talk about complex things, uh, for example, like this uh, hall here, uh, it's easier to describe it by a picture than you do it uh, with your words. So what we try to do is to figure out what information is really necessary for our colleagues um, to handle that job and uh, what information is necessary for our customers. In this way, customers like DSOs and utilities. Um, and we started to, to, to search for a platform and something, sometimes in your life you, you have to have luck. And suddenly in 2016, in the end of 2016, we were not founded. Uh, a, a tired Talal and a tired Florian sit in Essen and say, hey, we are here around, we have a platform uh, which is controllable, safe, and secure. Uh, and I said, I have data which are, uh, have to be controlled, handled, secure, and, and safe. So we came together, we built up a platform now, and we start to sell it in the uh, 1st of July this year. So we, 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 we had a time about two and a half years now to, to come to this point. So what we did is, uh, we are only, 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 only a small company with, with at, at the moment five or six people, but many supporters around. And this is the first thing you need if you found a company, uh, company in your company like Energy. You need supporters uh, who gives you the money, you need supporters to give you resources and to give you the space and everything of these three things uh, are happening. And yeah, now we're sitting here uh, with several partners. Intertrust is our partner for the platform and we are able to uh, combine grid information, which is today automatically calculatable. So we have 50,000 substations in that platform now. We can calculate on demand, uh, we can give forecasts. We have 144 different arguments on each roof on, in, on each house in Germany. So uh, we are able to share these, uh, these informations with utilities, with DSOs, and the platform gives us uh, the option to, to do it like a switch on a, a switch, nothing else. And uh, yeah, this is the way to do it. If you don't have the, the option to program by yourself, you have to search for partners. And we found five, six, uh, several partners we like to work with, not only about know-how, about culture. And yeah, it makes fun um, to create something new. And what we can deliver is picture you never saw before. Um, you, you, give, you get insights in your location you never saw before and you never can imagine that you can have this information and put it together with the grid and talk about the future because everything is related to the grid. Thank you. Hello, Tal. So I'm Thomas Florent. I am the, the CEO of uh, Axelos. We, um, so my, my career over the past 20 years was at the intersection of um, uh, energy, innovation, and risk. Uh, Axelos was created about seven years ago. It's got nothing to do with blockchain. Sorry. So we, we count our blessings. <laughs> um, so what we do is we, um, we help owner operators protect their most critical infrastructure. And for this, we, have, uh, we work on continuously reinventing the world's most powerful uh, engineering simulation technology. So from a predictive maintenance perspective, we keep talking all the time about predictive maintenance in the industry. Uh, yet there is a tremendous amount of predictive power that is actually generated at the design stage of the asset and which is not reused in operations. Um, that's, that's a bizarre conundrum, because if you are talking all the time about predictive maintenance, and, and you've got all that predictive power sitting on the other side of the wall, why not reach out to it? That's what Axelos cracked. So we took the technology that is used by literally every engineer of mechanical asset at the design stage, and we made it operations ready. So we made it a thousand times faster, we coupled it with sensors, and we made it a much easier workflow. So with this, we, we basically have created today what is the largest predictive digital twin in the world, for example, for an FPSO for Shell. And we're working on, of course, many other projects in the, in the industry. 
So my confusion is when you said digital twin, I usually associate that with ledgers. But while you have the microphone, what I'd like to do, and we, we should try to keep our, I'd like to involve the audience, we should try to keep the answers a little shorter than they've been. Um, Entrepreneurs take very non-uniform probability distributions and, and they, they're basically engines that transform them into more uniform probability distribution that makes it easy for large companies to sort of take, you know, you pre-take the risk, you de-risk a problem and you add value. And it's a, the fundamental model of entrepreneurship. The ideas have to come from somewhere. So the, the first question I'm going to ask is, how did you have the idea to do this? I mean, what was the aha moment? And then the, the follow-on question, of course, is how did you sort of go about choosing your investors? Because as, as was pointed out earlier, entrepreneurs have a tremendous amount of choice about who they seek to partner with in terms of funding. So where did the light bulb come on and why did the light bulb come on? I, so if I take Axelos, it's, it's what would be called a technology push, but I don't adhere to that framework because very quickly it turns into iterations, of course. Um, I think one of the, this, this is a general purpose technology, very powerful. I used to work on it in the lab in 1999 at MIT, so it's been, it's been created for a long time um, and built up for a long time. But there is one moment regarding the energy industry when Shell came with 20 people at the MIT Industrial Liaison Program and with what they call a, a game changer. Uh, mindset and a task force of 20 people for 48 hours re reviewing spin-off, reviewing labs at MIT. And, and they said, okay, yes, you're applying this in the mining industry, we can see that, but we really need this in the energy industry. And then th th that's the start of a great collaboration. Uh, so that, that was what drove us towards energy, which we knew was always a big prize, but there, there was this uh, very strong industrial liaison program at MIT which helped be the catalyst for that, like Free Electron can also be for other companies. Regarding investors, that could be a long-winded answer, <laughs> but I'm quite savvy on that front, having worked in finance uh, and having good advice from people who have set up <coughs> serial unicorns, let's say. Um, we are a deep tech company, so initially we did not want institutional capital. We went only for permanent capital. The first seven million in, uh, in money was essentially permanent capital uh, meaning business angel with a lot of uh, resources, and then grants and then customer income. And we waited five years before we even approached institutional capital. And being a spin-off from MIT, you do have access, right? But we decided not to go there because there is a time constraint and a pace that has to be different once institutional capital is on board. And yeah, once we, once we got there, we organized a, a well-structured uh, round where we got to several term sheets and uh, we did the unconventional play to go with only corporate VCs. We had a term sheets from standard VCs. Um, uh, the reason for that is, frankly, the partnership with Shell had been great as a, as a relation with the customer and so on, and they are a big name in the industry, and we wanted to uh, leverage that. That's great. Let me, well, Peter, you're, you're funded by one company, so maybe we, 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 if you want to comment on, you know, why you did that and how you <laughs> keep the, the gravity, you're like a moon of Jupiter, basically. How do you keep the gravitational pull of energy from, from sucking you in? <laughs> so, um, as I mentioned, it, um, we, we lost some contracts, and uh, if you look in the poor faces of your employees and they ask you what's up tomorrow, um, you have to have an answer as a leader. And um, uh, we had that situation in noise here around the corner um, that we had an existing uh, company and this company was just uh, yeah, running around, no revenue, something like this. We said, hey, let's build up something new in this company related to utility in noise and to the municipality or the city of noise because they're really uh, together in one, one uh, infrastructure company. And um, it didn't work, but we had the idea. And suddenly we said, okay, if, if it doesn't work, uh, let's talk about founding a known company. So uh, the first step was uh, Energy gave up, uh, uh, bring up a new, new strategy. And part of this strategy was the 4P model, and 1P was partnership. So I said, okay, if they write it down, that partnership, let's act like this. I was searching for some partners, and uh, we said, okay, uh, let's, let's try to, to figure out what is really uh, possible. And then I stepped to my uh, Westnet leaders and said, hey, let me out of my job, and let me try something new. 
and they gave me the room to do that. They gave me the money. Uh, Christian Orms gave me, uh, he, he met me the first time in Tel Aviv, and I told him something about my idea, and this was just an idea. And suddenly he was uh, the CFO of the grid side. And uh, yeah, he, he was the one who gave me the money to do that. And this is something depending on trust. So, so if you have a, a stupid idea to do things new, you need something, someone who, who supports you, and they did it, and yeah, now we have to pay back. So you had the idea, you found somebody, well, you volunteered to take personal risk, step out of a very good job, and then you found somebody with money who believed in you, who gave you the space and the funding to proceed, and here we are today. Yes, right. that's it. Let me, actually, I'm gonna switch gears, because the time is a little bit tight. Just question to any of you, just jump on it. Employee incentives. How do, you, how do you get the best talent? How do you attract the best talent? How do you get them to stick? Who wants to take that? You want to? I mean, we, we are in Silicon Valley, and uh, as you know, is the hotbed of all the activities related to AI and big data and machine learning and all the buzzwords that you can imagine. So we always think that our biggest competitors are companies like uh, Google and Facebook, and the biggest challenge, frankly, that we face is to uh, to keep uh, to to retain uh, and and attract uh, talent that actually knows these technologies uh, beyond the buzzword has actually used it. So one of the uh, things which we have used as a strategic advantage in this uh, sort of competition is uh, showing the value of what data scientists can do. A lot of people in our company worked at Google or Facebook or Uber, and they are simply at a point in their life where they don't find that much more meaning by improving the click-through rates by another 0.02% uh, over what the state of the art is. And here they have an opportunity to transform an industry, uh, be at the ground floors of, uh, of this transformation, really drive thought leadership and innovation in a massive multi-trillion dollar uh, opportunity. So, so we have been able to successfully uh, use that. I mean, we, uh, as far as industry domain experts are concerned, uh, we have never had any issues attracting them. I mean, we are probably one of the hottest places for somebody who is in the, in the utility industry or in the energy industry to come and work. And for, uh, for folks who are uh, more data science driven, uh, we tend to look for people who can relate to this problem and can actually uh, find uh, some mission in solving this problem, and we have been so. So, in the old retention in incentive model, where you 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 bias on greed, <laughs> or you bias on fame, is your team more biased on fame, or are they? I, more I think it's more bias on mission, bias on purpose, bias on like what is the impact? Uh, can we make a dent uh, in this universe? So, I think all the other things sort of follow. Any, uh, are you a fame-based company, mission company, great yeah, company? You, you have to at some point, uh, but, but, that's, uh, but to, to give you two additional answers to that. One is uh, we started global as a company. So we started with three people on three continents, Ho Chi Minh City, Boston, and Lausanne. And that meant we had access to free talent pools from the onset, which turned out to be super helpful. And the second thing is, and I think it's often underrated in the startup world, um, I don't sell flexible hours, blah, blah, blah. I sell blood, sweat, and tears. What we do is hard. We want people who do performance, who do excellence. Uh, and I mean, the last two people I had, for example, to be my head of HR, one was on an, a lady was on Ironman, and the other guy was basically national or European level in badminton. But either way, blood, sweat, and tears, it, act it, it actually attracts a lot of people, a yeah. lot of good people. I buy that. How yeah, do you just, incent Japanese people? Yeah, just to add to the point of Amit and Thomas, um, I think on top of compensation, of course, um, but it's really hard to compete with a company like Google and others, especially in Silicon Valley. So we have to have a little more than that. Uh, one of the park to join to a startup like us is um, the dream, right? Uh, the shared vision. So, that, um, so that's something we try to sell uh, when we hire someone. You know, culture fit is another thing. Um, you know, we, we tend to hire some people who is ambitious um, as well as, um, you know, thinking out of box uh, type of person. We have a pretty diverse international 
group here. There's a question I've always wondered about. So one thing I learned a long time ago was there's a difference between capital gain and self-employment. And, uh, you know, when, when you're running or creating a startup, you're, you go to shareholders and even if they're strategic, you're trying to increase capital. You're, and uh, a lot of people fall into the trap of running a company like a shoe shop. You know, they're, they're open for a certain number of days. There's so many feet in town. There's so many shoes you can sell. That's not going to generate capital gain. Now, you know, it just, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, we're, we're, we're heavily driven by this capital gain mentality. It's a go, go quick, fail fast, start another company. I, I, I lived in Europe. I grew up in Europe. I, I spent a lot of time in Asia. I, people in these geographies tend to join a job and stay in it for a very long time. They, they tend to be more sort of, if, to the extent they become entrepreneurs, maybe this is not fair, they're more focused on creating stable enterprises that, that, that are more in the self-employment model than the, the capital gain model. Europe, Europe, Silicon Valley, Japan, and the United States, where do you guys, what, have you faced these challenges in terms of the building a fuel mix in the tank that really allows you to go back to your shareholders with maximum capital gain over a, a self-employment culture, or do you think you've self-organized out of that bind? Go ahead, Thomas. But we may be not the more advanced in the cycle, but I've, having worked in finance, I've always been very mindful about investors making money. They have to make money, right? And so uh, there's several levers you can pull on that. One is basically not to, um, uh, to be quite cash efficient. And so we've certainly pulled that. Um, another, I think, related question, because there'll be other lovers discussed here, but is actually <clears throat> from the entrepreneur perspective, I, I am also an investor in about 10 ventures around Lausanne, is do you, does the entrepreneur want to create or does he want to control? And uh, the shoe shop kind of syndrome often comes from that. It's people who actually want to be entrepreneurs not because they really want to create something big, but because they want to create, control their environment. And that's, that's not a sustainable way to grow a company, of course. Uh, so that's something to identify early on. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think uh, what you are hitting on, and I think it ties back to the sources of capital also. This is probably uh, uh, one of the toughest places for a traditional uh, Silicon Valley VC to invest in. Uh, I mean, it's regulated, uh, cycles are long. Uh, I mean, if, if the cycles are long and typical funds which have a 10-year life cycle uh, invest in it, uh, they expect to return in a certain amount of time, which is not always possible. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And so I think that what's happening is, and, and this is what I've seen in the last uh, couple of rounds that uh, I've raised, is that it has become a very self-selecting type of an ecosystem. Uh, the Silicon Valley VCs don't understand it and they don't want to invest in it, while everybody uh, who understands energy and who is in this domain uh, thinks that th this is, I mean, in investing in innovation, investing in startups, especially software and data-driven startups, is uh, where they need to be. And so we, uh, instead of us going and looking for investors, actually, uh, I mean, uh, over the last few rounds, we have found that investors have found us, actually. and. Uh, and they have been uh, uh, invariably corporate investors who understand, who can help, who can do the diligence in this area. I mean, this is uh, complex stuff, so the VCs find it hard to figure out what's real, what's noise, and uh, the strategics can do that, and, and they, uh, they have a little bit more patience in terms of uh, understanding the complexity. Let me, let me see if there's any, we've, we've got about seven minutes. Any questions at this point, or? You want, Stephen, you'd like to ask a question. I don't think, hey, Thomas, throw this at Stephen, will you? It's a conference and a gym. <laughs> Thank you. So Thomas, I want to pick up on what you just said there about creativity or creation versus control. And I find that a fascinating dichotomy, if you will. And so can you tell us the story on why you think that is why that's so salient in your mind. What, how did you essentially think about these two? Why did that first come to your mind as these are the two elements that you need to distinguish between? Uh, that's gonna be a pretty personal story. Uh, but I, I, I worked at some point for an entrepreneur. I worked for different entrepreneurs early in my career. Um, and frankly, I think both of them had left 
their corporations because not they wanted to create something big, but they wanted to exactly control their environment. Uh, with one of them, I had to sit down and draw circles to show that there's maybe five people in the company, and if you aggregate, aggregate all five people, it's a big circle. But if you only take the subset of where he is, he was a brilliant person, but if you only take that subset, it's a much smaller circle than the five circles together. That's where I was in my discussion, which is not a good place to be. And, um, and so I think I've seen that enough from that perspective early on as an, as an employee. Uh, but I've seen it also as an investor. I mean, um, it's one of the first questions I ask myself when I invest in a, in a company is, uh, do I really have someone who want to create someone, something big? Or is he someone who's going to want to primarily control? Um, and it's not always easy to identify, right? But um, yeah. Any other questions? I, I do have one last thread. I can throw some more meat into the water. If any questions out out here, you want to ask a question? Sorry, is it a bit easier to hear me now? Um, the question is about uh, using uh, the data that is being uh, generated and and created and whatnot and if there's um, thought being done on how companies can more effectively use the data that you're giving them, generating for them, as far as uh, workflow management, actual tasks or responsibilities within the company, creating major incidents and whatnot that can then be um, appropriately assigned through the departments for predictive maintenance or for um, you know, whatever purpose uh, you have there, and if there are specific systems you've identified that would facilitate that, or thoughts gone into um, how best to enable that for your customers as well. Sort of the next step of the process. So to, to grab all the data together in one place is a really hard task, and it needs years. So if you want to start the change of energy now, you, or you, you want to start in five years, you have to start now to, to collect your data. And um, this is the main task for everyone, from my perspective. On the other hand, um, what we try to, to show is what is really possible with your data. And it's not about only show data, it's about quality of data as well. So you have to, have, uh, you have to fulfill many tasks in the first step. If you get your data in one row from the DSO side, for example, um, you are able to, to create nearly everything because you got it on one place. But this is a hard work, it's like uh, cleaning up your cellar, and uh, I, I build a new house without a cellar, but if you got a cellar, it's hard work to, to keep it clean, and this is the first step you have to do, and yeah, this is a special task for every DSO worldwide, and everybody's ticking in the same way, this is fun. 80-20, uh, it's always the same. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, I, what you're alluding to is the central problem, right? Data is a tool, and then how do you create business value for the customers, uh, which is really going to drive adoption of, of these, these tools. So, I mean, uh, that's actually probably, if you think about uh, our history, uh, uh, I mean, figuring those use cases, the killer apps, is where we have spent the most time. I'll give you just a couple of examples on how uh, some companies have used us. Uh, so we have a customer in Texas, and... Uh, they, uh, they run a city, a city of San Antonio uh, utility, and uh, it just so turns out that the weather patterns are such that, that when the market is long on wind, they're short, and when the market is short on wind, they're long. And so just on a couple of days of trading, they can make millions of dollars by looking at the, the weather data, the generation data, understanding what the consumer uh, consumption profiles are, and then optimizing the demand and supply patterns around it. Another example, one of the largest utilities in Florida, uh, we look at data from their entire distribution network and we see uh, patterns which predict when an outage might happen on their network and over the last uh, year or so, we have saved them about four million minutes of outages, uh, which is uh, 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 pretty significant. At the early stage of our company, we, uh, we made a very uh, conscious decision on not to make money out of data uh, because what we do is to deliver the data, our customer data, to uh, you know, securely. So 
um, but we decided to empower our customers to be able to uh, use that data, uh, analyze and you know, visualize, and do whatever they need to do. Uh, so that has been our focus from the beginning. If I may bounce on that, I think that's a very important point because we, we often hear data is the new oil, right? And then, and then you get the CEO of Cisco coming to Davos and saying, okay, well, um, you know, data is a new oil. Of course, he sells routers. He's going to say that, right? But it's only so if it's actually not siloed. In that sense, it's very different. So when we have a reflex, the next reflex after data is a new oil is, well, I should, I should kind of hoard it, right? It doesn't work. It, loses all, it loses all meaning. Uh, you know, think of, you know, the CIA needs to cooperate with a number of other agencies in order to actually do something meaningful to catch someone, right? Uh, because of borders and so on. So silos don't work with data, and in that sense, your decision was uh, actually one which is sometimes content counterintuitive with respect to what investors want to hear, but definitely, I think, the right one, yeah. Any other questions? We could go on for another couple of hours, but I can hear people's stomachs gurgling. So uh, lunch is next door. We'll resume at 1.45 p.m. Um, we have some, yes, Peter. Last sentence. The largest transformation you have ever seen is Inter just started as a t-shirt company. <laughs> now, now they're selling a platform. This is a great job to love. For t-shirts. <laughs> so, on that note, thank you for your attention and enjoy lunch. And we'll see you at 1.45.